Open up to Mark chapter 2, please, in your Bibles. And would you please stand at the reading of God's holy word. Those of you who are watching our broadcast this morning around the United States, in fact, around the world, we want to welcome you and um, we want to tell you Jesus loves you. We love you. We prayed for you. It is not by accident that you are with us this morning. God love you and God bless you. We're in Mark chapter 2. Let's pick it up at verse 13. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And when the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Some of yours will also, the later manuscripts added to repentance. Amen. Father God, I want to thank you and praise you for including this event in the Holy Bible. For Lord, it not only teaches us, but I know that as we seek our Lord and as we open our hearts to his voice, there are some lessons that we're to learn here. There are some, not only just insight, but I believe, Lord, that you're going to download some powerful things from your very heart into our heart. And so we, we come with that sense of anticipation and faith. And Lord, we invite you. Just move on us in such a way that, Lord, we'll be transformed. We won't even be the same because of the word that we have heard today. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen? Turn around and say to one another, I might not be a tax collector, but I am a sinner. Would you please? <laughs> now, on our Sunday morning gatherings, we have been highlighting what it means to uh, be a real follower of Jesus. So far, some of the truths we have gleaned from this series are a follower of Jesus makes the necessary sacrifices to personally engage him daily. It's not enough to have a knowledge about the Lord. We have to personally engage the Lord by faith, have a faith relationship with him. That's what being a follower really is. Also a follower of Jesus applies to his own life all that Jesus believed and all that Jesus taught. How can we say we're a follower of Jesus and not believe what Jesus believed? And not believe what Jesus taught? Uh, believe what Jesus believed about the Holy Bible. Believe what Jesus believed about his own identity. He claimed he is God. And so we respond to him accordingly, don't we? We respond to him in worship. We respond to him in repentance. We respond to him in, in belief and faith. We respond to him humbly. That's how we respond to God. Amen. A follower of Jesus also accommodates Jesus' righteous ways into his own lifestyle. We allow the Lord to transform our hearts so that what the Lord considers sin, we ask him to take out of our life. 
and what the Lord considers right and righteous and just and good and loving. We ask him to include it in our life and we start living it out in our own life. This morning I want to have a conversation with you about another aspect of what a true follower of Jesus is. See, a follower of Jesus accepts the Lord's priorities as his own. In fact, a true follower joyfully, gladly embraces what Jesus has said is a priority for him. It then becomes a priority for us. Amen. And what I want us to kind of focus, with this as our general theme, what I want us to focus on this morning is I want us to focus on Jesus' top priority. For if it was a top priority for Jesus, should it not be a top priority for us? Amen? If there's a problem with that, someone ain't following somebody else, or maybe you're wanting Jesus to follow you and make your top, his, your top priority is his, and no, no, he gets to be in front. Amen? Now, at the beginning, in the middle, and in the end of, of Jesus' ministry on earth, he told us what his priorities are. And as a matter of fact, it's interesting. At the beginning and the end of his ministry, both time, he, he declared his top priority while people were being totally offended at Jesus with the way he involved himself with the most hated bunch of men in all of Israel, the tax collectors. Now, I know you all don't love paying taxes. Can I get an amen? Amen. Ooh, it's on YouTube. The government's going to find you. Okay, it's true. It's true. We don't like it. But un unlike the government accountants of our day, tax collectors in the Bible days were considered traitors. They were Jewish people who were working for Rome. But oh, it's worse than that. Not only were they considered traitors, but they were viewed because of the kind of clout and the power. In fact, they could call a, a battalion of, of Roman soldiers to help get the money that they needed you're not getting. They could do, they could do that. And so to, the, to their fellow citizens, the rest of the Jews, they pretty much saw tax collectors in the same genre as gangsters or loan sharks or mob thugs that were backed by the Roman government as long as the Roman government got their cut. Now, you know, the Roman government basically said this, we won, I think it was 25 to 30 percent of everything. And whatever surcharge you want to add to that for your expenses, fine. Just make sure we get our cut first. And so what these guys would do is they would, they would tax you 40%, even up to 50% if they could. Whatever they could get, because they had to give 30% to the government. Now, unlike our tax system where we get a nice little... Well, if you're, if you're self-employed, quarterly, you know, you pay out your taxes. If you're working for someone, it automatically comes out. It's gentle. It's easy of your, of your stuff. And then, of course, you pay taxes at the store and, you know, for certain items and things like that. We, we pay it that way. Not like the Bible days. In the Bible days, a tax collector would see what you have in your garden. And he would estimate the cost if you were to bring that product to the market. Well, what if you're not bringing it to market? Doesn't matter. He sees what you're producing in your own garden and, and what 40% of it or 40% of the money. He would be there at the marketplaces and if you're selling, you know, you're, you're sewing and you're selling things, he would estimate and he would want his cut. If you're out by the lake, like, like what this incident reveals, they would have tax collector's booths all around in strategic places at the lake 
so that whether you're a commercial fisherman and come in with a big with a big catch he would estimate what you have and would want a 40 percent cut from you or you were just taking your kids or grandkids to go fishing and the three of us we go out there and we bring back 10 fish that tax collector say stop and he'll take four of them thank you very much and it was like that with everything you did see you're already hating their guts aren't you <laughs> you know that's the way that's that's how they felt but look at what happens you know here's a wonderful truth and we got to get it in our hearts. God loves sinners. Here's a trustworthy saying. The reason the Son of God came to earth was to save sinners of whom I am the worst. And he loves tax collectors too. So we pick up at verse 13 read it with me once again would you please by the way by the way that says crowd I noticed that on my on my notes if you have if you picked up notes it says a large crowd <laughs> big bird fall showed up there a large crowd okay let's 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 read the actual scripture please. once again Jesus went out beside the lake a large crowd came him and he began to teach them just days before this two very important events took place that pointed to that whole region of Galilee that Jesus was Messiah Jesus first of all he healed a Jewish man of leprosy that was the first time in history that a Jewish person was ever healed of leprosy you see they were under a, a covenant system where you were blessed if you kept the law you were cursed if you didn't keep the law because everyone is a sinner they could never keep the law and so they were always under a covenant curse well who in the world can heal one who was cursed by God unless it is God himself who decides to have mercy Amen. And here Jesus is, and he's showing them, showing them by just healing this man. First time, I'm Messiah. And then, in Capernaum, Jesus was in his little rented house, and all of these religious leaders, all of the religious elite, all of the teachers of the law, came over in fact they said it Luke tells us all the way from Jerusalem they all came his house was packed full of all these religious guys and Jesus began to teach them well there were four men carrying this young man who was totally paralyzed couldn't get through you remember and so what they did was they climbed up on the roof they moved the roof tiles aside and they lowered the young man before the Lord and Jesus looked at him and he said your sins are forgiven and they didn't even say this the Bible said they only thought it all these religious leaders were going hmm who can for this is blasphemy who could forgive sins but God alone and the Bible says Jesus knew what they were thinking and so he said, which is it easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and take your mat and walk? Then he looked at this crowd and he says, so that you will know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Amen. And this is God who came in the flesh. He said to the young man, get up, take your mat and walk. And instantaneously he was healed. Well, you know, news started buzzing about Jesus all around Galilee. And there Jesus was at the Sea of Galilee. And a large crowd came and followed him, and he was teaching them. Let's go to the next verse, verse 14. Read it with me, would you? As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. First of all, I want you to notice something. The first thing I want you to notice is Jesus didn't say, would you like to follow me, please? 
What did Jesus do? It was a command. Now, this is really important. I'll tell you why. Okay, Jesus commanded. Now, let me ask you something. According to the Bible, was Levi steeped in sin? Like all of us. According to the Bible, was Levi, according to Ephesians chapter 2, dead in his sins and transgressions? Like all of us. Who that's dead in their sins and transgressions can even be a follower of the Lord? Who can even want to, let alone have the wherewithal to even do it? The Bible says that before we were saved, that in our minds we considered God our enemy. Now God didn't consider us his enemy, but we considered him that way. We loved our sinful ways, we loved ourselves, and we just, you know, we just, come on, quite frankly. So how in the world can this happen? Well, first of all, does Levi get up and follow him? Think about it. He leaves his position of wealth and power. Now, you see that where Jesus says, follow me? See that there? It doesn't mean come and just hang out with me and show up in my classes once a week. To the Jewish, to the Jewish people, in fact, that whole culture, they understood that to be a follower, you are making a lifelong commitment to constantly be with and to constantly have your life now shaped to become like the person you're following. And he gets up and he starts doing this. How did that happen? Ah, you see what we don't read, but is taking place at this moment, was at the command of Jesus. A miracle of grace is happening in this man's life. Tell me what happens first. Before you get saved, does grace happen first or does repentance happen first? It's only by God's grace you can repent. You don't repent on your, you don't, that's only God that does that in you. All right, again, let me ask you another question. Let me ask you, before you were saved, what happens first? The life of Christ comes in you or repentance happens? That's right. For the word of God says, while we were still, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. Now, at that moment of the life of Christ being birthed within us, there's still a choice. We still make a choice. And we could say no to the grace, and we could say no to the life, and we could just make a decision. In fact, Wednesday night, you're going to hear about the story. I won't tell you how it all ends, but you're going to hear about the story about when Reinhard Bonnke was young, and he was an evangelist, and he had given an altar call, and there was this young lady, and she was up there, and she was weeping. And he says, oh, what's wrong? She says, oh, I wish I could be saved. I wish. He said, you can be saved right now. Just let's, let, let me pray with you. You can be saved now. She says, I can't be saved. I can't be saved right now. And he said, why can't you? She says, because my boyfriend is not a Christian. And I love him too much to leave him. I love him too much to leave him. Won't tell you what happens next. You have to come Wednesday. What a good hook, man. You have to come Wednesday night. But here's the point. Here's the point. The loving grace of God came in at the command of the Lord and ignited repentance. Ignited. Oh, it wasn't totally articulated yet ignited, ignited faith. Oh, it wasn't except that he left everything behind and got up and followed the Lord. You know, all of these other things. Now, these things will develop and these things will be articulated and will come through. They will. But let me tell you, salvation was already at work in this man. 
It's impossible otherwise. We make the mistake to think when somebody prays the sinner's prayer, then salvation happens. Did you, do you understand that when a person prays the sinner's prayer, the reason why he could pray it is because salvation has already begun to occur in his life. Otherwise, he wouldn't even want to pray it. It wouldn't have happened. He said, no, forget it. The prayer when we say, oh, Jesus, Lord, I repent of my sins. I believe you died and rose again for me. Come into my heart. Come into my life as my personal Lord and Savior. I put my faith in you. When we pray that, when we say that, it is already faith that has happened because God initiated the miracle. Amen? Amen? All right. All right. So. Look at verse 15. Read it with me. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. I want, I want, you, to, I want you to notice some things here. First of all, I want you to notice that Levi's new life in the Lord automatically was being experienced in the realm of personal relationship with Jesus. We cannot say enough about this, brothers and sisters. You and I are called, if it's real faith in the Lord, if it's real Christianity, it is, it is wrapped around and centered on that personal relationship experience with Jesus because we don't just get life independent of the Lord, it is His life in us. Amen? And here, and here we see this is happening. And not only that, but who else was there, who else was there eating with him? Many, what? Tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and the disciples, for there were many who followed him. See that many who follow? Who's the many that he's talking about? Tax collectors and sinners. Something began to occur in the hearts of these people as Jesus was ministering. See, already the Jewish world just totally disbanded them. By the way, when it says sinners, it didn't just mean that they were sinners like, oh, I'm a sinner, I, I, and I, I, I lusted in my heart, God, I'm a sinner. You know, that kind of thing. When, when, when it says sinners in, in the context of the Jewish community, these are just people, Jewish people, who had given up on the rituals, given up on the law, given up on going to temple, given up on this stuff. For whatever reason, they're just, it's just not part of their, oh, they might do some of the cultural things, but they're just not, they're just considered by the rest of the Jewish community, oh, they're just sinners. And here, away from the temple, away from the religion, they find God in Christ Jesus. Wow. And there wasn't a few, were there? What does it say? Many, Many were already coming to new life through Christ Jesus. But the third thing I want you to notice is this. Levi has a very effective plan of evangelism. And it might not be too difficult for you to follow it. This is Levi's plan of evangelism. Have a dinner party. Invite Jesus to be the guest of honor. Have some of his followers show up and have some of the rest of the sinners show up and let's see what happens. How cool would that be? Well, but Jesus is invisible, and do we set a plate for him or not? I mean, what do we do? I kind of freak the people out. You could figure it out. Just show, just show one little video clip about Jesus, the Matthew movie or something like that. And Hey, we want to talk about Jesus. You know, Jesus is here, and, we just, and this is just really cool, and we just want to, you know, we just, I just want to let you know how much I love Jesus. You know, watch what happens. 
You know, you and I have made evangelism way too hard. Way harder than it needs to be. We think we need to make, any of you ever been in cells? We think we may need to make cold calls when it comes to evangelism. I want to let you know, if they give an ear to you to even hear, they're ready for you to speak to them. It's not a cold call. And you don't have to talk anybody into anything. All you have to do is just lovingly tell the truth because Jesus is the one who will call them through his truth. You don't have to try to beat them over the head with your Bible. You don't have to try to do anything. You just trust the Lord and his love for them. Amen. Amen. As a matter of fact, we're going to be praying. And this week, I'm asking the Lord that he's going to give you an awareness of opportunities to share Jesus. Because the Bible says, you know, that, that the Lord is adding to the church daily those who are being saved. You're going to stand in line at the grocery store and someone in back of you smile at them, they'll smile at you and they're going to say, what is this world coming to? Invitation to share the gospel. Right? In fact, the Lord miraculously puts us in so many places that if you would just open your heart, but I'm preaching next week's sermon. Open your heart and open your eyes. You'd be amazed at how many people are actually, if you would listen and look, actually begging for you to tell them, please tell me about Jesus. It's the truth. Our biggest hang-up is our perspective. You got to overcome that. But I said too much. Okay. Maybe part of the problem is, is we're a little bit like verse 16. Let's read it. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? See, Jewish tradition said you become one with the person you share a meal with. And to the religious elite, you are always guilty by association. You are. Now, brothers and sisters, we've got to pray about something about ourselves. Because, I, 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 you know, we look and we read the Bible about the Pharisees and the Sadducees and when the teachers of the law and what they say. I, I just want to let you know, the things that drive the Pharisees is part of all of our sinful nature. It drives all of us. Every one of us if we don't watch out and we don't stay sensitive to the Holy Spirit, can become just a little self-righteous. Thank you very much. Amen. Oh, come on. Would you say amen to that? Amen. Oh, we can. We can. A person who's wrapped up in his own self-righteousness cannot accept that another person is right with God unless he looks like him. Well, you've got to go to my church. You've got to look like me. You can't be right with God. And not only that, unless if you're really wrapped up in your self-righteousness, you have to have my approval. All that is is a stinking religious spirit manifesting itself through you. And it's part of our fallen nature. It's not hard to be that way. We, we will say, oh, well, I don't want to be like those people. They have to go to that church and wear suits and the ladies can't wear makeup. And oh, boy, they're just so self-righteous. Where now we become our own little self-right. Could we just judge them? And we're going, oh, I'm in my own little culture, and it's all, I'm just so right, and I'm just so cool, and we, we got the cool Christian culture going on, and oh, you're not like, they probably really don't know the Lord, or they're not really close up, they're probably really not fine, oh, they don't do music like we, oh, they no, 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 really, really? What in the world does that have to do with the very heart and the passion of Jesus to save sinners? 
Amen? And who are you to say that somebody is or is not saved? Only God knows. Poor C.S. Lewis. How many of you are familiar with C.S. Lewis and his writings? Chronicles of Narnia, Basic Christianity, some of us write. When you read C.S. Lewis's diary, you read his book, he'll tell you, I can't tell you when I got saved. I could just tell you right now I am. He cannot give you a definitive moment, but he could tell you he, he began this faith and it started growing and started believing and started. And some people come to the Lord that way. But we want to say, oh, you're not saved unless you say this prayer this way. All we're doing is we're just trying to we're, we're just trying to massage our own self-righteousness and our own unbelief. Trust the goodness of the Lord and fingerprint Jesus in that man. Amen. He'll be transformed, changed, comes to belief, comes to repentance. It, it starts happening. Amen. Amen. So Jesus says this. This is really interesting. Verse 17. Read it with on hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. See that word call? Now, Jesus will say this in another, another way. At the end of his ministry, Jesus says, The reason the Son of Man appeared was to seek and save the lost. And we're a little more familiar with that term saved, and so we like to use it. But we have to ask ourselves, what does this word call mean? Well, we have the example, don't we, with what Jesus just did in verse 13 or 14, when he called, you will follow me, follow me. But understand something. The, the word call, let's go to the next one, Mike. The word call uh, denotes a beckoning, an identity, and a destiny. I've not come to call. I've not come to beckon the righteous, but I come to beckon the sinners. Get this. I've not come to give the righteous identity. I come to give the sinners an identity. I have not come to fulfill those who think they're righteous. I come to fulfill the destiny of sinners. A, 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 a beckoning. I want Irene. It's time for Irene to come to dinner. So I just have the plates and the, and the dinner there and she's out in the field and she's just working and having fun. And, and so I just go, I just go like this. Um, hoping she'll get my vibe. And she doesn't show up for two hours later. The dinner's cold. I'm all mad. Whose fault is that? I read because you didn't get my vibe. No, it, that's not a beckoning. I have to call Irene. I have to beckon her to what? And Jesus beckons us to be made whole by God through his salvation in Christ. Amen? A call is a beckoning of the Lord. Well, not only that, but I, here's Irene out there. And I, and I start going, I start saying, Tatiana, Tatiana, time to come to dinner. Well, Irene's not going to let you. She, she's wondering, why am I calling her daughter? Because I have, to, I have to speak to her. I have to give her an identity. Right? Otherwise, how do you... And what's the identity? When Jesus beckons us to the wholeness that comes through salvation in him, he says, and your identity will be a follower of mine for life. You will identify with me and I will identify with you. But even more than that, there's a destiny. Because what Irene didn't know is she came for the dinner under her plate 
is a check. Watch, Irene's going to get excited. <laughs> For a million dollars. That just changed your destiny, didn't it? I bet you the first thing you'll do is quit that school. No. Really? I'm taking my money back. <laughs> it's not the destiny I planned for you. All right. God, did you know God knew you before the world ever began? God planned you before the world ever began. God understood the fall, and so he and Christ and the Holy Spirit understood that creation was going to be created with redemption fixed in its history. But God had this wonderful plan for your life, this destiny. And then we were born, and we were born in sin, and we blew it. We blew the destiny. But the reason why Jesus has come to be our Savior is to bring us back to the destiny that God had always planned, the wonderful plan for us. Now, when I was a teenager, I, I had this problem. I, I loved the Lord. I loved Father God. I loved Jesus with all my heart. But I just couldn't trust that they had my best interest in mind. I just tell you, that's the truth. Oh, I would tell them I'd follow them. I'd tell them I'd do anything. But then I would secretly think, I hope they don't make me go to this place because I don't want to do that. I hope they don't make me do this kind of ministry because I never want to do that. Hope they don't make me marry her. I don't want to marry her. And I'm just saying all this. And I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to. You know, hedge my bets with God. And and all that meant is that I couldn't yet trust the Lord. And I couldn't trust the Lord with my happiness and my fulfillment and with my person. But it was after I kept walking with Jesus and my faith kept being developed that I started finding out, little by little, step by step, you've always had the best in mind for me. Your ways is better than any ways. Your ways is wonderful. Your ways is joyful. Your ways is fulfilling. Your ways, God, it's the most peace and the most joy and the most adventure. Now, by the way, it's hard too. But that's all part of the adventure. And he really has that destiny for each one of us. Get this. Who would have thought a kid born in San Pedro, Idaho, his destiny would be, I'm San Pedro, California. His <laughs> destiny would be Emmett, Idaho. And to be some clunky pastor here. But who's God's? And man, I'm sure glad, because I love it. I love it. I love it. And I know I'm in the will of God. I know I am. And I'm fulfilled. And there's not a day that goes by that I don't just crack up. And sometimes it's at you. <laughs> Sorry, but confession's good for the soul. No, seriously, it's just a wonderful life. God's destiny. But isn't it amazing that we're, we're not sharing that part when that's what Jesus says? You know, sometimes we just need to have a conversation. And like, I'm, since you're my son-in-law, and I'm going to probably buy you lunch today, um, I'm going to pick on you. Say, Blake, I, just, 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 just some dude I'm working with. Blake, got a lot going for you, man. Someday you'll be as handsome as me. <laughs> Blake, um, you said something kind of interesting about wondering where the world is going, and, and, and you, you've heard of Jesus. Is it just possible right now that Jesus is calling you to get serious and become his own? Is it, is it possible that, that he's calling you to come because he's got some wholeness for you that you'll never experience in your soul and in your spirit? Is it possible that Jesus is calling you right now?
to a destiny of a life that you couldn't dream of. It's so wonderful. Why don't, why don't you just make a decision and heed the call? Don't you need to tell him he's a sinner? Well, Blake, do you think that you're a sinner? I don't need to tell him. He already knows. Because God's word has already worked in his conscience. It's only the self-righteous that you need to talk to about their sin issue first. Yeah. And, uh, and you know you need a savior, right, But Yeah. And I won't set you up for anything else. Off the hook. <laughs> I just saw relief come over my brother. <laughs> you, see, you see that? Okay, here's the point. The thing that Jesus prioritized the most was to call sinners to new life of salvation that he provides and that he shares. That's his top priority. So if the Lord's top priority is to call sinners... And a follower of Jesus accepts the Lord's priorities as his own. Shouldn't we too commit ourselves to being used of the Lord to call sinners to the salvation he has for them? No, he didn't call you to try to talk them into anything. You don't have to do that. God will make the miracle happen anyway. You can't talk a person into salvation. By the way, if you talk a person into salvation, somebody else will talk them out of it. Amen. It's got to be a miracle from God. So, well, we're saved in this place, Tim. What's this whole sermon about? Remember Jesus said in the last days, one of the two things that are, that are troubling before it even begins the tribulation that's going to happen. Many are going to abandon the faith. But get this. He said the love of most will grow cold. My brothers and sisters, I want to ask you a question. How's your love level when it comes to loving sinners the way Jesus loves them? Have you spent all your time trying to avoid them? That you set up a wall and a prejudice to them? And you're no longer being their friend and no longer loving them with the love Jesus has for them? Has your love for the lost grown cold? He calls us to have his own passion for souls. We're going to talk a little bit about what that looks like next week and what the Lord does in our heart to restore that love. But let's, let's pray about this right now, shall we? Would you allow the Holy Spirit to do some inventory on your own heart? How's your love level? Kind of going on empty? Have you filled it with something else? We want to invite you, Lord, to just look at our hearts. Jesus, we want to invite you to begin to change us. Holy Spirit, do help us to be very aware of your inventory in us. Where has our love level gone? Jesus, we want to invite a revival. You've been giving us a revival of prayer in this church. 
Now we're asking for that revival to extend to our hearts. Would you revive our hearts with your love for the lost? Would you revive us, I pray, dear Jesus? We love you and we thank you. Would you forgive us, Lord, for our hearts growing cold? Would you change our hearts? If some of us, our hearts, hearts are rocky, Father, we bring it to your cross, the Jesus now, and we ask to just exchange it for a heart of flesh. For Have we allowed ourselves to become self-righteous in our own kind of ways? Would you forgive us? Jesus' name. Stan, would you please?